This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 492, recorded on May 4th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Happy Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. (laughs) You were dying to say that, weren't you? Yes, yes. (laughs) I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that. May the 4th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a great uh, tweet from Heathrow Airport, if you haven't checked it out look at it. It's got a picture of their departures board, and it's really good for anybody who's into Star Wars. Cloudy and 26C here in New York. Uh, It's wispy clouds, but really looks like Springfield sky blue with clouds. And 72-22 here. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And yeah, I was going to hit the Star Wars Day uh, thing as well, but Kathy already got to it. And now I'm Googling the Heathrow thing, but the pictures aren't loading properly. So I'll have to have to check Tell that us out. About it. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? Okay, here. Uh, let me see. What do we got here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm looking up. I'm looking up the Star Wars stuff. Oh, yes. They put departures <laughs> to to destinations in the Star Wars universe. And then they, yeah. they have delays <laughs> on a couple of them for reasons that you would you would expect Alderaan canceled. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Off Someone has a sense of humor in the world. Uh, yes. or avoid clearance from, of snow from runway at destination at Haas. Uh, uh, yes. Camino is uh, Camino is delayed. That says delayed a long, long time in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> very <good. clears throat> That's very good. nice. How about that? That's a real, the, the real- Wookiee planet. Extra security at gate, all crossbows must be checked in. <laughs> you know, the British are good at this kind of stuff. Yes. The one April, the one of the, oh my goodness, look at this. They've got, a, <laughs> I see, they've got a picture of um, the airport that's been photoshopped, that's got X Wing fighters in the Mil- Millennium Falcon in the, uh, <clears throat> you know, docks. Cool. All right. Yeah. So on April Fools, once they had a, a whole article in one of the major British newspapers about the spaghetti harvest. <laughs> it was uh, pretty good. All right. So at sixty three here are seventeen C, and we're oh. just at the end of a major rainstorm. Oh, chilly. Um, and yeah. Uh, well, it's because this cold front come through, and we really needed the rain. So, and it's been a nice day to hang out in the rain. So that's right. good. It's all good. ASM is a special opportunity for our podcast listeners. Get $50 off registration for Microbe 2018, June 7th to 11th in Atlanta using the promo code ASMPOD. ASM Microbe 2018 connects scientists with their science and showcases the best microbial sciences in the world. Delve into your scientific niche in eight different tracks. Don't miss this opportunity. Visit asm.org slash microbe. That's asm.org slash microbe and use the promo code ASMPOD for $50 off registration. See you in Atlanta. The microbiology department at the Icon School of Medicine is seeking faculty candidates interested in strengthening their program in virus host interactions. Applicants must hold a PhD and or MD, have postdoctoral experience, and be interested in creating a virus-related research group that will complement the pre-existing departmental program, recruitment of individuals or couples at the level of assistant, associate, or full professor will be considered. More information about the department and the school can be found at icon.mssm.edu. If you want to apply, please send your CV and a brief description of your research plan to nycvirology at gmail.com or contact Ben Tenuver directly i think it's really cool that they specifically say that they're recruiting individuals or couples yes Mm -hmm. sure 
You bet. It's good to have two positions, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. All right. We have a follow-up from an author on the paper we did last week, the norovirus paper from the Virgin Lab. This is from Craig writes, greetings, TWIV team. I'm a long-term listener, all 491 episodes, and huge fan of the show. I'm writing from St. Louis, where it's a beautiful spring day, 78F with clear blue skies, winds from the southeast at 15 miles per hour, 60% humidity, and a dew point of 62 degrees. Sadly, though, the cherry blossoms have (laughs) faded. By the way, the cherry blossoms have just just come in around here, Vincent. I wanted to let you know. (laughs) I have to say that there are two kinds of <laughs> cherry blossoms. There are the pink kind like they have in D.C., which I don't like. But then there are smaller white ones that are quite nice, actually. They they oh, bloom yeah. a little earlier, it seems. We have, the, we have the small white on a weeping cherry in the back Yeah, here. yeah. This, we have, those are nice. <laughs> okay. But, but there are not many of those. In Washington, it's the other kind. Right. Okay, continuing. I wanted to follow up on TWIV 491, where you kindly covered our paper on norovirus infection of tuft cells. Given space constraints, we weren't able to elaborate or give as much background as we would have liked, so I'd like to answer some of your questions and offer some clarification. I apologize in advance for the long email, but fortunately the space constraints of TWIV letters aren't so tightly enforced. And not at all. You can no. write as much as you want, and we will publish it. And and that's the way the journal should be, too. Sadly, one day maybe we'll get there. First, I wanted to give background on the different strains of murine norovirus used. These strains can largely be classified into two buckets. Because noro is always in two buckets. <laughs> The first are isolates that cause acute infection that is cleared by the adaptive immune system, MNV1, CW3, etc. Oh, is that Christian Vobus 3? Mm, I think uh, so. Cool. That makes sense. I never thought yes, of that yes it says that down below. Mm-hmm. These strains replicate in systemic sites such as the spleen and liver in addition to the intestines, but these strains are not significantly shed in the feces and thus are not readily transmitted between wild-type animals. These strains are largely an evolutionary dead end, although they still represent an important and valuable model. In contrast, the second group of strains, MNV3, CR6, represent wild-type circulating noroviruses that infect most wild and laboratory mice. These strains persist for many months, if not the life of the animal, and are robustly shed in the feces and are easily transmitted between cage mates by coprophagia eating feces. Rich mentioned that it was the acute systemic strains, MNV1 and CW3, which are the wild strains in mice. We would disagree with this as strains such as CW3 are not readily transmitted between mice. Rather, it is the persistent strains that infect tuft cells that are the predominant wild-type circulating strains. Everybody got that so far? Right. Uh, Yeah, I have questions about it i mean where did mnv1 and cw3 come from right well that's coming. Uh, actually there's some there's some comment on this down yeah, here. it's okay. coming right both cw3 and cr6 are infectious molecular clones from plaque purified viruses cw3 was originally isolated by christian voba cw from the brains of immunodeficient stat null mice while cr6 was isolated from the feces of wild type mice from charles river laboratories it is the persistent tuft cell tropic CR6 strain, not the acute strains that can be prevented with antibiotics, evade adaptive immunity, transmit fecally orally, and induce inflammatory bowel disease like phenotypes in certain mice. Both strains recapitulate different aspects of human norovirus pathogenesis, so are valuable. It's also important to realize that some of the uncertainty in human norovirus tropism may be due to tropism differences of different human strains. Unfortunately, they are not infectious molecular clones of human norovirus. The virus is still isolated from infected human feces for work in cell culture. So my question would be, why aren't there? Is there some problem? Right. Uh, well, you can't grow them. Well, I thought you could grow them in B cells without uh, with, with bacteria added, right? Isn't that the... Uh, yeah, okay. So... so- I don't know the I don't know the latest on that. Yes, you can, but it's it's a it's it's a finicky system. When last I 
knew of it. I don't know. It's it's not like slopping something onto cultured cells and getting a load of virus out the other end. So I don't know what the status of that is. You were going to say hey, something, Kathy? Yeah, because I wrote to him because I wanted to make sure that uh, in his email, I guess it's coming up, he talks about infection. Oh, no, it's already had. Yeah, the infectious molecular clone. I wanted to make sure the definitions were the same just because of this exact sentence. And um, by infectious molecular clone, I mean that the entire viral genome exists on a plasmid, and we use this to generate stocks for CW3 and CR6. For human norovirus, you can obviously make a full-length molecular clone with the whole viral genome, but these human norovirus clones are not infectious. Possibly that is because we don't know the human norovirus receptors. So the... Uh, yeah, why can't inf- they put them into B cells? And because the B cells can be infected with fe- fecal filtrates, right? <clears throat> well, we'd have to ask. We'd have to ask Stephanie about that. Right. right. This is Don't very. Co- this is all very complicated. Right. And this, but this also helps explain. I, I mean, we were scratching our heads about how you see one result in this paper and a different result in this paper, but this explains that because the different papers are looking at yeah. really different systems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which would have been nice to have, but due to yeah. the constraints, but due to those space constraints, <laughs> they couldn't. They couldn't mention that. Uh, and this uh, statement up here, the CW three. I mean, he's he's arguing that the strain they use, CR six, is uh, I suppose you could say more relevant. He's calling it the wild type strain uh, that's transmitted in cultures. I mean, he points out that it was isolated from the feces of wild type. Uh, mice in a commercial mouse colony, whereas CW3, one of the acute strains, was isolated from the brains of immunodeficient mice. So uh, I, I, the the implication is that CR6 is a, a, a more relevant strain to study. But I think more generally, you could just say that these are different strains that have different uh, mm-hmm. pathologies, mm-hmm. Uh, and the differences are interesting. Right. And, and-, and what's relevant? Because the human infection we think of as an acute infection, yes, and that is the what we would call the normal human infection, and the the mouse infection that's acute is the one we're thinking we're now saying is the abnormal one, and the CR six, which is chronic, we're saying is the normal one. So, what do you you're you're trying to model the human system, and therefore you could argue about which is more relevant, right? And wouldn't it have been nice if in the beginning they would have called the first one MNV1 and the next one 2 and 3 and 4? Yes. But no, some of them. So we have CW3 and MNV3. And one of them is the acute and one of them is the persistent. So yeah. you can't just go by the number. You have to go by the letters. And I must say not, that if you're not working in the field, that the numbers, they don't mean anything to you right away, right? Right. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So, oh, well. All right, he continues, while we focus primarily on the wild-type CR6 strain of MNV, we did perform similar bone marrow transplant experiments with the CW3 strain. This four months of work is summarized in one line of main text <laughs> and in supplemental figure one. <laughs> that is just, that's just a synopsis of the current state of science, isn't it? It's horrible. Right. It's horrible. We are right. subjected to this by the journals, and we put up with it. Both radiation-sensitive and resistant cells contribute to CW3 tropism. This multi-cell tropism is consistent with the recent beautiful RNA scope work from the Karst lab that you mentioned and which we will do next time. Rich also asked about the role of B cells in MNV infection. Previous in vivo work also from the Karst lab showing B cell tropism of MNV strains has focused on acute systemic strains. In contrast, we do not see a significant role of B cells in viral pathogenesis with CR6. Okay. But that, so that CR6 mm. is the persistent strain. Yeah. Correct. But in that science paper, originally from Stephanie Karst and Christiana Vobus, the other persistent strain, I have to scroll back up and find its name or number, is studied and they do show that uh, that's right. it infects that. B cells. Okay. It's, you don't think it's CR6, though? It's another strain? No, it's the other one. It's uh, yeah. M- MNV3 Yeah, is the one that's in the science paper. So that, so that says that there's a difference between MNV3 and CR6, and they're both yeah. these persistent strains. All right, continuing. Uh, rag knockout mice, which lack B cells, are infected similarly to wild-type mice. With CR6. With CR6. 
We have also not observed antigen-positive B cells with CR6 in immune-competent wild-type mice and do not observe a contribution to NMV fecal shedding from B cells, which are radiation-sensitive, at early three days post-infection or late time points, 12 days, as shown in Figure 1a. The mechanism is norovirus B cell tropism and its role in pathogenesis in mice and humans is exciting and important work that needs to be studied further. You all all also mentioned the seeming paradox of how broad-spectrum antibiotics can prevent MNV infection, and yet germ-free mice remain susceptible to infection. The antiviral effects of antibiotics are relative, not absolute, as shown by Megan Baldridge. Antibiotics can prevent the vast majority of infections in mice challenged with 10 to the 6 PFU, but not 10 to the 7th PFU of MNV. Similar dose studies demonstrating whether germ-free mice are relatively resistant to MNV compared to conventionalized control animals is an important future experiment. We don't yet know how tuft cells from wild-type germ-free and antibiotic-treated mice differ from each other, but this is an active area for us. Interestingly, antibiotics prevent CR6 infection, but not CW3 infection. To answer some general tuft cell questions you all pondered, Tuft cells are post-mitotic and proliferate from the intestinal epithelial stem cells in the base of the crypts. They are sloughed off from the tip of the villus. That's for you, Dixon, who said they weren't sloughed off. We don't know whether MNV kills tuft cells, but this is something we are looking into. At the population level, there are no significant differences in tuft cell number between infected and uninfected mice, but since only half a percent of tuft cells are infected at any one time, this does not rule out or in lytic infection by MNV. <laughs> That's a striking number there. Half a percent of tough cells infected. Yeah. yeah. And remember, these are not common cells to begin with. Not many in there. Yep. Finally, Vincent brought up the idea of polio infecting tuft cells. We considered this and love the idea. Evidence of PVR expression in human tuft cells is unknown to my knowledge, but it would be particularly interesting to look at this in the rare individuals who can chronically shed polio virus since we know that virus infection of tuft cells can evade adaptive immunity. We typically only see about one infected tuft cell per slide of mouse intestine, yet viruses shed at 10 to the 6th genome copies per fecal pellet. It's a brand new unit of measure, a fecal pellet. Perhaps no one has observed polio-infected epithelial cells in vivo because they are similarly rare. I just want to point out that whether the tuft cells infected tough cells can evade adaptive immunity or not. It doesn't matter because the people who shed polio are already immunosuppressed. They don't have, they don't make antibodies. Thank you all for everything you do for science and viruses. Keep up the great work. Hope to see you all at ASV. This is Craig Willen, MD, PhD, who is an instructor and in the lab of Skip Virgin at Washington University in St. Louis. And he adds a PS, I'm starting my own lab at Yale this summer. So if there are any TWIV listeners interested in studying norovirus pathogenesis and tuft cells, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll even throw in some free TWIV swag to the first hire. Cool. That yeah. is a big incentive. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> New Haven's a nice town, too. Yeah, it's a good place. Yale is a good place. I'm nice betting water. that is, yeah, thanks, Craig. I'm betting his name is pronounced Wylan, but what, what did I say? Willen? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's Wylan because there's, there's one L, yeah. Right. At Wylan Lab or Willen Lab on Twitter. Okay, now since we were talking about norovirus, I found a cool article from uh, the Emerging Infectious Diseases Foodborne Outbreaks Caused by Human Norovirus. This particular strain contaminated nori, Japan, 2017. In 2017, there were over 2,000 cases of norovirus infection caused by contaminated nori. This is the seaweed that's wrapped around sushi. Dried seaweed. And it's just great that it's nori and norovirus. Yes. <laughs> that would be a good show title. <laughs> the, the, the cool thing here is that so they they did amazing tracebacks of the product. Infectivity remained for over two months at ambient temperature under dry conditions, although the the percentage of people with GI symptoms gradually decreased from the date of nori production, suggesting a decline in infectivity over time. And it, I think it was traced to one manufacturer of uh, nori. Wow. So I suppose it gets in C. And then it contaminates the seaweed, and then they harvest it. 
Uh, my guess would be that somebody handling the seaweed contaminated. That could be two. That could be two. Because the dilution in seawater would be huge. Well, that's the solution, isn't it? Yes. Hi, Dixon. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. What's the weather out there? It's a little muggy. Muggy is the best way to put it. Okay. You have to be careful when you're in New York and you say that. <laughs> you're right, Helen. We just talked about a outbreak of norovirus in Japan caused by contaminated nori. Do you know what nori is? <laughs> How ironic. <laughs> How yes. ironic it is. Indeed. Indeed. Dear, dear, dear. Uh, Rich, can you take Tom's email, please? Sure. Dear masters of the Twixome, it's 80 Fahrenheit, 26C in Austin slash Thorndale, Texas. It's been overcast for days, but the clouds are all rushing north to join their tornado party. <laughs> is he telling the truth? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Nobody. Uh, my uh, question is in regard to the article in my subject line, which I don't have here. Uh, but, oh, is this it? Trillions upon trillions of No, viruses. it's the RNA no. vertebrates that we did last time. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Um, I don't understand how the indicators for the presence of RNA viruses in an animal alive today can say much about the age of the RNA virus. Is there some kind of timestamp indicator on the RNA virus signs found in these subject animals so that we can say that it, it, its ancestor from 500 mil, million years ago was the first one to encounter slash take up that virus and not just its great, great, great grandpa. As one of Rich's Caleb's, my thought was, what if one of those RNA viruses emerged half as long ago as the animal's origin in the fossil record? Or maybe only 50 million years ago. Could you tell? Uh, Tom is uh, listening and thinking very well. Yes. Got it all. Okay. So, there, yes, there is a, some kind of a time stamp indicator. And that is what it's, what does EVE stand Endogenous for? Endogenous viral element. Okay. Right. So, these are bits of virus genome that got integrated into the host chromosome some time ago and so no longer evolve as a virus uh, but evolve uh, more on the order of uh, how the host genome would evolve okay and thus serve as a time stamp at least for that event that can be compared to uh, you know the uh, more current viral evolution this is often referred to as a molecular clock in these mm -hmm. types of studies where you establish the time frame for something based on mutation rate in, a, in an organism that you believe you understand. So those are two separate things. The clock is the mutation rate, and you can right. back calculate how long the viruses have been circulating. And the eve, you can tell by knowing the phylogeny of all the species, right. the host species— you can tell that you know if two species have a common ancestor and they all have the same eve, then it inter that virus was circulating before the common ancestor. And since right. we have a nice phylogeny according to time, right, the jawless fishes being the oldest, and et cetera, all the way down to mammals and birds, you can roughly know. Now, the the question is: today you harvest 182 vertebrates and you find viruses in them. <laughs> How do we know that they were the ones circulating 500 million years ago? You don't. You have to make some assumptions, right? And so you you can use these calculations. And in fact, in that paper, they didn't have a lot of eaves, actually. They did a lot of molecular clock calculations. But, um, you, yeah, you are making some assumptions, and you have to uh, see how different they are from you know, other species and see if that— and as they said in the paper, the timeline of host phylogeny mirrored that of the virus phylogeny. So that kind of gives you confidence that these have been evolving together. For a long right, time. so you make some assumptions going in, but then you can spot check those with the eaves that are there and yeah, with, the, yeah. with what you know about the evolutionary rates of these organisms. And but the best thing would be to do is go back in time. And 500 million years. Collect some samples, and as I always say, I would love to have a time machine. Only H.G. Wells could do that. Time machine and some <laughs> tubes, and I'd go back and come back. That's right. With Except them. entangled quantums appear to allow for teleportation. What? I just read that in science. Tangled quantums? Tangled 
quantum. Stuff. Yeah, but would they allow you to go back in time? <laughs> well, you know, and the bigger we're, we're, problem is that when Vincent goes back in time, he's going to contaminate everything with his this microbiome. True. This is all true. Yeah. And then when we're I not going to know. There's not going to be anyone left. No, we'll, we'll right. all look like you. Because you know the the old story where the guy went back in time, he stepped on a yeah. butterfly and he came back and yeah. everything was yeah. different. That's right. Wonderful. Yeah. But it can't happen. So there you go. Uh, Tom has a pick, but we'll we'll save it. Uh, it makes for interesting speculation. Later. He said, have we established a, a time for TWIV? No, the only know place that we know it's in Austin. <laughs> we know it's at the university, I assume. We have a date for it, don't we? We have a date, June 29th. June right. 29th. I don't know what time it's going to be. And we will we'll all be there. You should come, Tom. And, yes. And Neva. Absolutely. Neva should come. And the 29th Neva is a Friday, come. so it's I, I actually have it just as Two o'clock on Friday because that's when we normally record. <laughs> quiz, but. Could be, could be at two, mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. It's up to our host, our local host, yeah. right? Yep. We, will, but I don't want to do it at ten a.m. It's too early to no. talk about viruses. Well, it's never too early, but it would just feel, you know, sometimes we sometimes we do twivs at weird times, and and the feng shui is all messed up. <laughs> I, I agree. I do agree. Yeah, that's true. All right. So today we have a a, a treat. For us and you, this week's well, science. it's more of a diagnostic than a treat. <laughs> this week's mm -hmm. science, the cover is has the words de detecting viruses. Yeah, it's a Zika virus replica, huh? I don't know what that it is. It is. No, I read the cover. I, I, I get science, it's, It looks actually. like it's in sand. It is. It's right? it's made in sand. It's a, like a sand drawing, like Picasso oh, okay. might do, you know, and except it's of a Zika virus. How much virus. is your uh, science subscription, by the way? I have no idea. It's worth every $100 penny. a year? doesn't matter. More than that. Really? Yeah. Whatever I, I think pay, it's, it's I think it's outrageous because we pay thousands of dollars to publish every article, and there's no need for them to charge so much. Anyway. Write them they, a letter. I have they to, pay for all those extra writers yeah, in the I front know. matter, know. like right. Alan Dove and so on. <laughs> exactly. The, uh, the, 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 there are three articles which describe three. CRISPR techniques three. for the development of nucleic acid de detection assays and, and detecting viruses. And uh, we're going to talk about those today because um, it's really cool. As you will see, CRISPR, clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic Peats, kind of adaptive immunity in bacteria and archaea. They use RNA-guided nucleases to target and degrade foreign nucleic acids. Mm. And this is, it all started with yogurt, right? <laughs> all started with yogurt. Some guys at Dannon trying to <laughs> figure out how bacteria became resistant to phage, because phage are a problem if... Uh, you want bacteria to help you make yogurt. So now, and what I what I love about this, and I'm sure I've mentioned it before, is that the people in industry did the basic science, and then the basic science researchers <laughs> in universities the did the applied right. work. <laughs> and, you know, so That's because they also funny. worked on reverse transcriptase. That's funny. It's <laughs> turned around. Yeah. Well, um, as many of you know, this uh, CRISPR and the other part of CRISPR is Cas, which is the nuclease, mm -hmm. which stands for CRISPR-associated protein. And there are lots of CASs in right. all sorts of bacteria and archaea. And mining that diversity has been really informative. They can be divided into lots of different classes. They have different kinds of activities. And as you'll see today, that's what makes all these different uh, assays possible. Now, many of you may be familiar with using CRISPR to modify genomes, right? because CRISPR will make a nice double-strand DNA break at a very precise spot, which you can target by, say, putting a Cas9 protein into cells along with a little guide RNA to guide it to the part of the genome you want to cut. It will cut it. You can introduce mutations. You can replace alleles. And, of course, maybe someday we'll edit people. <laughs> so I just want to jump in here and, and say that, to me, if you think about this, uh, as a parallel to the restriction modification system. Um, to me, when we say you can CRISPR this or CRISPR that, we really mean that you're using the CAS 
part of it, which yeah, is the, right. the nuclease. Yes. That's right. And what you were just saying about, you know, there's all these different Cas proteins. It's like there being lots of different restriction enzymes that have different activities. And yeah. these yeah. Cas proteins have different activities. So that's, to me, where the, uh, if you think about it in those parallels while you're thinking about this, and you can do genome editing with restriction enzymes, and you can do it now with these Cas CRISPR-associated proteins. Right. What's remarkable from an uh, outsider's view here, a non-virologist's view, is that if life arose, let's say, 3.58 billion years ago, then very early on this system had to occur because it was an RNA virus world or an RNA world first, as, as the hypothesis goes. And this is a very sophisticated defense system, just like the restriction enzyme systems. I think this is incredible. From that perspective, it's ancient. It sure is yeah. ancient. Yeah, but it's got lots of nuance in it that is reflected in resilient biology, which allows it to survive into the present. That's the way I look at this. So these three papers take advantage of these different cast-like proteins to develop amazing diagnostic assays. Um, and the first one, in no particular order, but the first one is called multiplexed and portable nucleic acid detection platform with CAS13, CAS12A, and CSM6. So these are all CRISPR-associated nucleases with different specificities. And this comes from Feng Zhang's lab at the Broad Institute. Yes, yes, Rich Condit. I'm just going to say we have another uh, nomenclatural debacle here with the uh, Yes, first <laughs> we do. And we have that because the groups, the, the, there are two labs, one on each coast, really, right. that are that are working furiously on this. And we're going to talk, This, I, I guess if we're doing this paper first, we're going to talk about the, the Boston group. Um and they have filed for patents on a lot of this, and everybody knows that these are going to be extremely valuable patents. At the same time, there is a West Coast group out in California, and we'll get to them in a moment. They have also filed for patents on CRISPR-related technologies, and there is currently a legal war going on between these two groups, and so they don't really talk to each other much, I think, and they are going to come up with different terminologies and defend them to the death, I'm sure. So this paper um, from, so Feng Zhang is the PI of this group at the Broad, and it, the first two co-authors are Jonathan Gutenberg and Omar Abduaya. Abduaya? Abduaya. Ah, good. And so this is looking at different Cas enzymes, all right? And the cool thing here, first of all, is something we didn't um, ever talk about before, is that Cas9 uses an RNA guide to target DNA. But there are Cas enzymes that target RNA. And this was discovered not too long ago, just last year, I believe. And they are thought to be defense against RNA phages, right? And they actually right. used an RNA phage screen to identify the guide sequences that are used. It's just amazing. I mean, old you go back you start going back in the literature. It's just so much cool stuff. So they use um a Cas called Cas thirteen A. It's just something that you're gonna remember. <laughs> right? But it was right. previously known as C2C2, which I might have remembered better. Right. <laughs> R2D2 would be better, but... <laughs> so basically, you make... A, this is a protein. It's a nuclease, and you can make a small CRISPR RNA or CR RNA to target an RNA. It will cut the RNA. But what they found is that... It also it, goes on a killing spree. Yeah, they, right. they call it collateral cleavage. Yes. If any other RNA is around, it'll cut it. But it has to be triggered by, by the original the, thing. By the original, it has to yeah. see its target, it and when its it sees target. its target, it'll cut that and anything that's standing around. Right. So that's the basis of the assay. It's like an Uzi. Yes. <laughs> that's the basis of the assay, where you take a another RNA and you make it so that when it's cleaved, it fluoresces. And as Kathy pointed out to me, I couldn't figure out how this was being done. And she said, well, there's a quencher at one end of the RNA and a fluorophore at the other end. And then when it's cut, you separate the two. I was so buried in the weeds, I couldn't figure it out. And then it, so this, this 
collateral cleavage is used for your readout, right? So that's one part of it. The other part, which is so cool, they said, let's find nucleases with dinucleotide specificities. And they looked in all sorts of organisms uh, that are Prevotella, Lacnospiraceae. <laughs> and they looked, Capnocytophaga. Stop it. Canamorsus. You're making me hungry. <laughs> so every organism has a different bunch of these cas associated nucleases, and they ran assays to figure out, can we find ones that will recognize different dinucleotides like A, U, U, C, A, C, and G, A? And then we could put a, a different fluorophore on an RNA with a different, and so you basically are making the cas specific for a color by having it specific for that. And then you could run a reaction of multiple assays in one, which we call multiplexing, right? right. So that's so the- So you take, you take one CAS and put a particular guide RNA in that, and that will, in a mix, give you a readout that's one color. Right. And you can have four different guys with different guide RNAs with different colors, and that's where you get your multiplexing. So you can mix them all together, okay, and- do diagnostics for target sequences for four different RNAs in the same tube. Which, Unbelievable. Which is great for flavivirus research, right? For many viruses. Yep, for many viruses. So they started with one. They showed you could do Zika virus Just and, a flavi. and dengue virus. Just a flavi. Two flavies in the same channel, specific, right. Right. so that, that works. And they um, can detect two atomolar Atomolar concentrations, like yes. like word. and then they can improve it to detect at zepto molar. Is it zepto so or are, zeta? I don't remember which one. It's zepto. Zepto, <laughs> zepto not zeta. So this is the, and what are those? Yeah, ten to the minus twenty-one. Zeta, the zepto. Zepto is There's a lesser-known brother of Groucho Marx. Right. <laughs> so ten to the minus twenty. It's very sensitive. So they, they've called this thing, the, the Jean group is calling this thing Specific High Sensity Enzymatic Reporter Unlocking, or Sherlock. <laughs> Very clever. Now, I think, you know, being in Massachusetts and working on cleavage enzymes, they should have done something with a, with a Lizzie Borden reference. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they can make it even more sensitive. And this is just I don't know. What do they just sit around and think of these? Listen to this. Yes, There's yes. another CRISPR nuclease, CSM6, which happens to be activated by cyclic adenylate molecules or adenine homopolymers ending in two prime, three prime cyclic phosphates. Okay. It turns out that Cas13 from two different species make products with two prime, three prime cyclic phosphates. So basically, they can combine. CSM6 and Cas13, and the Cas13 will make a product that is in turn sensed by CSM6, and that will cleave your reporter. So they can amplify the signal, and they design now, they they design activators that will do that. Go ahead. Now you can't multiplex that. No, but it's yet. very sensitive. Yet, but it's very sensitive. Yeah, that's where they got down to uh, ze Zepto. That got them to the Zepto moles. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think of this as, you know, uh, a way to find RNA that uses the guide sequence, okay? The, the guide sequence is the mm -hmm. way to find RNA on a very, very, very sensitive and specific level and carry and, and it, you're uh, carrying an enzyme along with that that does stuff that gives you a readout, Yes, okay? It's incredible. I mean, this is... This is a, a like a total perversion of what these things evolved for, oh, right? Yeah, but people being clever, it's great. Yeah. They're so just to reiterate, clever. so you have your cast protein, you give it a guide RNA, which is whatever you want to detect, Zika, dengue, you know, multiplex, you can do multiple ones. And then you use a cast that will cleave a specific fluorophore that you've set up. And you can put a couple of these in one reaction and you can say what's in this sample, right? And even better, they figured, you know, fluorescent assays, you need an instrument to read the fluorescence, right? You do. So they said, let's try something where we don't need an expensive instrument. So they make a lateral flow assay where you have a 
you know, like a slide looking thing with a matrix on it. And you, you, you put your solution at one end, it flows across by wicking. And then there are different things along that will make a color reaction. So they basically put an antibody to the fluorophore in the lateral flow strip. So it would be captured. And this is analogous to a lot of over-the-counter and yeah, and right. uh, rapid dip diagnostic sticks. tests. Dip yeah, sticks. strip dipsticks. Yeah, dip sticks. so they say they can detect Zika RNA at two atomolar. <laughs> How many viral particles is that? <laughs> two. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. And they no, also we, no, we we do know it's uh, one copy per microliter. Yeah. I in the other paper they talk about copies per microliter, but they also mention. The atomolar, so so two to, two atomolar is two copies per microliter. Two atomolar. Well, it depends on the tissue type, but it's around one copy per. So microliter. this is single copy detection, basically. Yeah, it's very sensitive, but that's what PCR can do. So they have to match it, right? They also could say they also said we can take your saliva and extract DNA and detect genotype. You know, if you want to detect something, some cancer phenotype or genotype, yeah, whatever. they talked they about either. cancer. They did talk about and, and they call they called it a one-pot assay. And so did all the others. Funny. Yeah. I wonder if they collaborated or if science made them do that. I found yeah, that weird. why they didn't just call it a one-tube assay. Yeah, well, what's this one pot? Really pot? Well, pot is legal in both California and Massachusetts. Oh, that must be it. It's a subtle yes. plug. Mm. A one so uh, we, we missed one thing out here, and that yeah. is in the in the uh, initial demonstration, they're just using straight nucleic acids that yeah. they that they've made. But in a clinical situation, uh, the uh, you can amplify the signal to start with by doing this. What's it called? RPA. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a it's a an amplification technique that does not require a thermocycler it's all right. done mm -hmm. it's yeah. a non-pcr amplification there there are quite a few other uh less well-known amplification techniques like this that are not pcr but they accomplish the same thing they accomplish the same thing and so for for a clinical application what you're going to do is take uh take the clinical sample and go through this amplification to start with and then plug that into the uh, crispr assay and they uh, do some experiments in the paper to show that that can be done in a quantitative fashion so that you can actually figure out how much viral RNA is in your sample. Yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, amplification, right? Because they use T7 polymerase, right? Uh, that's in the final step, okay? Yeah. The actual amplification of the uh, I've lost the name of it. I've the actual it's recombinase polymerase amplification or RPA, which has the unfortunate same initials as RNase protection assay. So that's how you can remember that. But mm. yeah, so, go ahead. Rich. Yeah, it, it involves a recombinase that will uh, that that uh, evades a heat step because the recombinase will uh, make a hybrid with your primers and double stranded DNA without having to heat it up. So you have a D loop, right? And then there's a polymerase, and I don't know what's used for it's some sort of DNA polymerase, and a single-stranded DNA binding protein uh, that's there to uh, keep single strands from reannealing, or, uh, and that helps the uh, the process. Um, so, and you can you you can either do a reverse transcription of an RNA sample and mm -hmm. then throw it into the RPA, or you can take a DNA sample and throw it into the R, uh, RPA, and then for the final diagnostic to make a target for the CRISPR, uh, for the Cas13, you uh, take the products of that, which are double-stranded DNAs, onto which you've conveniently stuffed T uh, uh, onto the ends of the primers, yeah. T7 promoters. Right. And now you can transcribe those with T7 RNA polymerase. That gives you yet a further amplification into RNA. Mm -hmm. Now, if I, I don't know if it was this paper or one of the others, but they do a, an assay where you just heat the material, so there's it's no extraction. Degrees, there's no extraction because right. you don't want to uh, have that's, people. That's right. Yeah, that's Hudson. Okay. That's, we're getting exactly. right. And, and we're getting you, there because here you have to do extractions of right. Right. Clinical, and that's if you really want a true field assay, it's it's got to be one pot, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. So this is a good idea for people uh, that are undergoing HIV uh, treatment that they mentioned because mm -hmm. they want to know what the viral load is and whether the treatment is actually working. And well, you could also 
see what kind of resistance mutations and you might have in right. the viral genome Straight already, evolution. right? Yeah. Yep, that's right. Yeah, there's so, a lot you could do with this. So this will soon be at a How long do you think the legal... Area. No, no, they're still in legal. <laughs> <laughs> that could take years. <laughs> the patent dispute will not be resolved before people come out with products with this, is, is my prediction. <laughs> right, and it'll take all your money away after. Uh, yeah, so, so people will be coming out with products related to the... And in fact, they already are making money off CRISPR-based stuff. Um, and in some cases, they'll license one patent or the other, and in many cases, they'll just license both to be protected. Um, and it's not clear that the patent dispute will necessarily go one way or the other. It may be it may be that everybody is declared a winner or um, the whole thing is denied. I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. I don't know. We're the losers in the end. Right. Maybe. Well, I mean, this is it's nice that the science is progressing and um, and CRISPR is the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, every time somebody looks at it, they find some new trick you can do with it. Yeah. Well, right. the interesting thing the interesting thing about the evolution of these technologies is that you know uh they they go away after a while i mean what's um restriction enzymes who cares anymore oh right? we use them <laughs> we still use oh, them good good but there's but, certain things cer certain gene targeting uh things have gone away like zinc finger nucleases and tailings right. yes, remember right <laughs> yes or radio right. immunoassays uh, maybe uh, so yes. The, <laughs> the other uh, the other part of this paper is without going into detail, they can tinker with this in a fashion that can uh, detect known single nucleotide polymorphisms. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. In genes. Yeah. Uh, it's because a, it's a saliva I, thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I get out of this is that uh, I guess you <laughs> can have mismatches between the target and the guide RNA. Um, and uh, a little bit of mismatch compromises the activity a little bit. Am I, mm -hmm. am I seeing I this right? right. Yeah. And more of a mismatch compromises it most, more. So if you have guide RNAs that do or do not uh, recognize a, uh, a, an allele change, um, you can compare the activity of a wild type and an uh, allele specific guide RNA and and determine whether you're detecting a healthy or a disease allele by the amount of activity that comes out the other end. Very very clever, right? So, so you could do you could do SNP profiles on um, the the human DNA or the pathogen DNA if you're doing right. any kind of assay. Uh, what I was going to say is, so this paper by Gutenberg, which isn't spelled the same way as the Gutenberg printing process, right. this is G-O-O-T-E-N-B-E-R-G, -E -E in case you're going to look for that. Uh, at the end of it, they say uh, that they summarize the things uh, that because they've designed this Sherlock, is actually Sherlock version 2, where they've added in a bunch of refinements, making it quantitative, visual, more sensitive, multiplexable, um, allowing all kinds of things table nine and then in table nine they compare version one versus version two and version two is a thousand fold more sensitive <laughs> um and it has the multiplexing it's faster it could be done in 30 minutes instead of two hours and the readout in addition to being fluorescent you can have this lateral flow and then there can be this signal amplification that Vinci mentioned the csm6 enhancement um uh, companion diagnostic, uh, I'm not sure what that line of the table means. The cost for each is about the same. Um, and then they list that there's all these different CAS 13s and CAS 12 and so forth that are compatible with this Sherlock 2. I thought the figures in this were quite nice, even though they're small. I like the little CAS proteins and the reporters and the guide RNAs. They Made it a little clear, but the but the the legends don't tell you anything. <laughs> no, and that's why um, it wasn't me that uh, clued you in on the uh, fluorescent part and the quencher part. That was someone else. But no, in color, that, it was your color? No, it's no, my green. Color. That's rich. That was rich. <laughs> green. Oh, I got my. I'm colorblind. <laughs> but so yeah, in in Figure One A, they have these molecules that have an F and a Q, but they never tell you that F is the floor and Q is the quencher. Yeah, right? that's right. They didn't have space for that. If they told you that, you did. <laughs> from the beginning. You know, I can barely see the Q because it's in a little circle unless I blow yeah. it up. Yeah. Uh, it's age, right? That's yeah. it. 
No, it's, it's science. <laughs> yeah, it's both. That's right. Yeah. All right. So the second paper, field deployable viral diagnostics using CRISPR-Cas13. And here the first two authors, co-first authors, are Cameron Mirvold and Catherine Fry, or Free Fry. And the third author is Jonathan Gutenberg, and the fourth author is Omar Abudaya. And the last and they're co third and fourth authors. And the uh, oh really? Wow. Yes. And then we have other people on this paper. Uh, we have the, the the last author is Pardis Sabeti, and um, penultimate Fe- author is Feng, Feng Zhang, is the senior author in the paper we just talked about. So there's a little bit of collaboration. And this is again from the MIT Harvard group, but this also incorporates um, folks from Florida Gulf Coast University. A couple yeah, of Sharon and oh, Sharon yep. and Scott. Yep, Sharon and Scott are on there. Um, and folks from um, uh, Honduras, from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Honduras, uh, Sao Paulo State University in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, Facultad de Medicina de, Sa- de São José do Rio Preto, uh, Sao Paulo, and Howard Hughes Med- Medical Institute. So it's a, more institutions involved. This uses the same idea as the previous paper, the CAS-13, the collateral cleavage of a quenched reporter RNA. Um, and their their goal here is mostly to make it field deployable. Um, again, to be able to read out without uh, an expensive equipment. So uh, they they start with Sherlock, right? Which is the CAS-13 collateral cleavage. They show that they can detect single copies of Zika virus and dengue virus with Sherlock. And they have a bunch of clinical specimens that they've acquired. Um, They extract nucleic acids and they can find positives uh, just like you would by PCR. So that's all great. But they say we don't want to have to extract in the field. And so what they do is they develop Hudson, heating unextracted diagnostic sample to obliterate (laughs) nuclease Hudson. This is getting a little silly. Look out the window and... We have Hudson here. So they just heat it. So they do Hudson-Sherlock, basically, and they get a- a- atomolar detection of Zika and dengue virus in saliva, urine, and whole blood. So that's pretty cool. You could buy a kit and spit into a tube and see a color change maybe in a half hour. But it's pretty awesome. And you go, oh, I have yellow fever virus or whatever. That would be less awesome. <laughs> now, can you sell these diagnostic kits over the counter or would they have to be prescription? That needs to be approved on a country by country basis. Is that right? So, because it would be cool to, you know, walk into a, your pharmacy and say, mm, what do I want to test myself? And yeah, you have I mean, a whole shelf full sell, of. If you want to sell a diagnostic kit in the U.S., you go to the FDA. Yeah. Right. And you present your data and and you present your you make your pitch for whether you want this to be used in hospitals and clinics or in clinical laboratories or in um, or sold over the counter. And the, the bar is set pretty high for selling stuff over the counter. You have to prove that it's robust, that it's hard for people to screw up, that it's going to store well on the on the shelves and and all this stuff. Um, it's a lot easier, of course, to deploy it in clinical labs where mm-hmm. you're working yeah, with people sure. who know what they're doing. Um, and in fact, there's even a, a, an arrangement where clinical labs can come up with their own tests. So to, it's not quite as onerous as getting a new drug approved, but there there are definitely hoops to jump through. I just think it would be so cool to walk into your local pharmacy or big box pharmacy and have a whole rack of virus diagnostic tests, right? Or maybe multiplex. You could have your Flavies, your Bacornas, your Orthomixos. I tell, I would be in there buying them all the time. <laughs> I think it would be so interesting to, to see what you and just, you know, take a little sputum or feces, whatever. Can't do blood. I guess you could take a finger prick, right? Boom, boom. That would be, I guess that would be really exciting. But I, I suppose companies will be doing this for them. Well, and the, the big market for this would be something like um, an over-the-counter flu and rhinovirus test. Right. Mm-hmm. So before you or go influenza. to your doctor and, and hound them for antibiotics, why don't you sure. pick up one of these swabs and figure out if you've got a rhinovirus or an adenovirus or the flu and multiplex those um, and, and then say, oh, wow, you know, I've got mm-hmm. I, I've got respiratory virus. This right. is just going to have to clear itself up. Yeah. I think it would be really useful for parents of kids in daycare. 
guess. Mm-hmm. That are curious. Yes. Oh, let them do their own tests. <laughs> oh, God. I'd, I'd have been buying these by the case a few years ago. <laughs> so yeah. I want to say just a couple of more words, uh, a little more detail about Hudson, because I <laughs> got into this. First oh, of all, yeah. I was a little annoyed because, you know, I mean, heating stuff up to throw into a PCR reaction and that kind of stuff is, you know, people do that kind of stuff all the time. But so it's not not a big deal. All that not that big a deal. However, it is interesting to think about this. I looked up that I wanted to know if if they had something special in here. No, they've got TCEP and EDTA, and uh, maybe I'm probably dating myself here, but I didn't know what TCEP was, and it's a reducing agent that ah, doesn't smell really. Oh, which mm-hmm. this. I mean, that takes all the fun out of it. Yeah, it does. Oh I love gosh. The, you know, yeah. I love the smell of DTT and mercaptoethanol. These are pretty <laughs> Mercapto- These That's are how you know you're doing the science. Think, That's right. You know, Especially in the morning. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Think egg yolks, gang. Okay. So, um, so this, not only does it not smell, but it's irreversible. So this will take a disulfide bond and reduce it irreversibly. And Mm -hmm. that's going to, in the presence, if you do that in the presence of heat, it's going to denature a lot of proteins. And there's, there's some ribonucleases that'll just go ahead and renature. But if you've, if you've irreversibly um, uh, compromised the disulfide bonds, it's not going to be able to do that. Then the EDTA, um, I know from painful experience that if you heat nucleic acids in the presence of a little bit of divalent metal, it'll shred them to bits okay so the edta among other things at least will chelate all the divalent metals around and make sure that that doesn't happen but that's all it is tsap and edta and boil them or 95 degrees close enough hmm. boil. just do people use tsap for protein gels now i believe so yes hmm. now we still use uh, bm mercaptoethanol yeah absolutely yeah it's uh, right and and i found one paper where it specifically stabilized full-length RNAs when they are heated at 50 to 70 degrees. Wow, cool. That's great. Wow. So they, um, so Hudson is sensitive, works. As I said, they also developed a lateral flow assay for this, like in the previous paper, except instead of using antibodies on the paper, they use oligos to capture nucleic acids on the paper. That works as well. They develop flavivirus panels, so you could look for Zika, Dengue, West Nile, Yellow Fever, all in one tube. Um, they have one for the four Dengue serotypes. That would be cool. You know which one you're and, infected And I assume with. the reason they're going after these viruses in particular is because they've got these collaborators or vice versa. They have these <laughs> collaborators in Honduras and Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. But also it's hard to make antigen-based diagnostics that distinguish these viruses. Yes. And that's been a big challenge since Zika emerged. And the nucleic acid does distinguish, but of course, you know, PCR, you need equipment and so forth. Right. So that's why this is a good target for this. They, they also show you can identify SNPs in viral genomes, right? So you can ask if there are certain SNPs that you're interested in seeing if they're circulating. You can do that. And they show that with Zika virus isolates. Um, so that's that one. Well, and I just want to mention that um, I think the reason that we have the uh, – wait, yeah, this is the one that has the people from Florida, right? Yeah, yeah Sharon and yeah, Scott, yeah. is that they did some stuff with uh, pools from mosquitoes. And, yeah, and that, yeah. I guess, oh, I was right. thinking was their contribution. Probably, yeah. yep. Mm. Yep. When I think about this stuff, I just – I mostly I imagine people in the field – during some sort of epidemic or something like that. I think of the Ebola epidemic or dengue uh, epidemics and et cetera. And being able to just, you know, collect some saliva and stick it in a tube and heat it for a little while and then uh, apply it to a strip and in a few minutes see bands that tell you what they've got. It's amazing. So how much... Parallel testing will we need before we're 100% confident or close to it that we can use this in the field? Do you think? Uh, we, yeah, we don't need 100%, but we need to. We need enough demonstration that, preferably in multiple hands, that this is uh, that this is robust. 
Yeah, because right here they they use a limited number of clinical samples, so we just need more. Because I, I, I th it's great, but you don't want to go in the field and, and do a thousand and find suddenly that there's an error rate or something, right? Right. right. No. Well, in fact, um, if you look at that v very first figure E one E, where they look, they get eight out of eight patients sera are positive um, by their fluorescent assay, and then they do their strip assay, and the in G and I think there's a couple of false negatives there if they're the same eight samples that are in one E. Mm -hmm. And they don't comment on that in the text. Yeah. They just say that they correlate. So that's paper two. And the third paper, CRISPR-Cas12A target binding unleashes indiscriminate single-stranded DNA ACE activity. I thought the use of unleashes was kind of unique. Yes. Right? Don't often mm. see that in a title. Well, it sounds like a Seinfeld line. Really? Unleash? Yes, unleash the hounds. <laughs> so the first three authors are co-conspirators, co-contributors, <laughs> Janice Chen, Enbo Ma, and Lucas Harrington. And this comes from Jennifer Doudna's lab. And, and this is the California Berkeley. contingent. California, UC Berkeley. Berkeley. Yep. And the cool yeah, thing UC here, Stanford. so here again, we have a different CAS, CAS, 12A, which was previously shown to be somewhat different, has different active sites, it recognizes different sequences, and when they were studying the the requirements uh, for substrate, they found that when you use a, a guide RNA to target a single-stranded DNA, the CAS induces complete, as they say, rapid and complete degradation of the entire genome. They call it single-stranded DNA shredding activity, which, of course, is surfing, right? <laughs> <laughs> shredding. So, mm -hmm. so in other words, if you have this CAS, uh, what is it, 12A, All right. and you give it a guide RNA that matches a, a target, and then you include in the reaction M13, which is a single-stranded circular DNA, the M13 will be shredded, even though it doesn't have any complementarity to the guide. It's an innocent bystander. It's another bystander, except in this case, instead of RNA, like in the previous one, it's DNA. And again, you need to have the, the CRISPR-RNA target interaction in order for this activity to be unleashed, right? Right. Right. And they call this single-strand DNA transcleavage activity. Mm. And I was trying to figure out if that was the same... Or maybe it's just the same idea as the collateral uh, activity. Uh, so in in the other paper, they called it collateral. You know, when it's this, uh, they've cleaved the mm. the target, but then there's this collateral stuff. And here they're cleaving the target, but then it's this trans cleavage mm -hmm. activity instead of collateral. Yeah, my understand. My understanding, Kathy, is that that. Is essentially the same. Okay. Is that the 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 target recognition activates a nuclease that then goes and does whatever it pleases, okay, right. on on something that doesn't have to have any homology or anything. Yeah. And the the difference here is that with um, Cas13, the target is RNA, mm -hmm. and the 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 target that you're guiding to is RNA, and the nuclease is uh, degrading RNA. Right. Here it's DNA. The target right. is double-stranded DNA, right. and the uh, the nuclease is specific for DNA. That's right. So otherwise, it's, in my mind at least, fundamentally the same. But of course, thing. in this case, you, you in both cases, you need to have a, a CRISPR RNA, a guide RNA. Yes. To guide to a target. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then the, the target is DNA, uh, but in in this case, it, it will cleave a, a, a nearby single stranded DNA, mm -hmm. right? Right, collaterally, collaterally, or, collaterally. or in trans, or in trans, <laughs> yeah. whatever. However, and we're all going to be subpoenaed as part of the patent case on this now. <laughs> I think not me. <laughs> all right, you didn't say anything yet. I didn't. I didn't put any money into that account. <laughs> so the they they set up the same kind of. Um, substrate here. They put a single-stranded DNA with a fluorophore and a quencher, right? Yep. So this was yep. single-stranded, and they show that this will cut it. So that's the basis of their assay. That this um, sort of the same as with the other, except the other was an RNA-based fluorophore, 
and this one is single-stranded DNA. Right. So this is the DNA endonuclease targeted CRISPR trans reporter or detector. Detector. <laughs> and they do a lot of nice biochemistry because that's the Doudna strength. She's mm -hmm. a biochemist, and um, the um, interestingly, the you know the the target, the the guide, the CRISPR RNA cleaved target DNA, the double stranded DNA, it just turns over. The enzyme turns over once, but the trans cleavage, two hundred and fifty turnovers per second. In other words, it hits the molecule goes off hits it hits 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 250 times a second really cool um what else here is interesting so they've obviously developed this uh, fluorophore assay and um, could it be reper okay so they do a lot of biochemical characterization then they say can we make an a dna detection platform so they decide to focus on human papillomavirus and they want to um, identify people who are at risk. And, you know, as you know, HPV 16 and 18 have the highest, among the higher risk for having uh, infections proceed to cancer. So they want to see, could this system, the Cas12A nucleus, distinguish between the two viruses? These are double-stranded DNA virus. So they target a sequence uh, that varies by six base pairs between the two genotypes, and they set up their single-stranded DNA fluorophore, quenched fluorophore, right, which will be fluorescent. They do the recombinase polymerase amplification. So they make, again, a one-pot method. They throw in all the components and the, the viral DNAs, and they can um, get very sensitive detection, atomolar sensitivity. So now could they, that's in a purified system. They say, can we do this in a complex mixture? So they take cultured cells infected with either virus and they add it to their assay. And it unambiguously identified papillomavirus 16 and 18. So that works. Then they went to patient samples. They took 25 human anal swabs that had been previously analyzed by PCR for HPV. And they... Uh, put their assay to work. Within one hour, it, it identified with complete agreement 25 out of 25 HPV 16 wow. or 18. And because those strain numbers do mean something to us by now because we've heard about them for yeah, years. Yeah, indeed. Those are, the t those are the two that are associated with human cervical cancer. Yeah. There are some others as well, but those are the Isn't that ones. funny when you hear something over and over, you get... Now, the people who study CAS on the other hand, would probably say, you know, I know 12, 13, 18, 45, but I don't know HPV 16 and 18. Right. right. Yeah. Well, and they say that um, they extracted DNA from cultured human cells infected with HPV 16, CHAS, mm -hmm. or HPV 18. Right. So, oh, maybe I misread it. That's maybe the first part. No, yeah. that's what they said, but I didn't, you know, that they doesn't don't mean make any sense infected. to me because yeah. th those are, those are, cancer cell lines that came from people with a cervical carcinoma. Right. And I think CHAS have an integrated HPV-16. And uh, HELAs have 18. And yeah. He, yes, right. and HELAs have 18. Yeah. So th there again, that's well, where, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> they know what they know. And they were infected a long time ago, but before they were cell lines. <laughs> right. So they uh, have made a nice platform here. Which uh, the, the f fewer data than uh, the first paper, I think, but again, it's an interesting use of a single strand specific nuclease. Again, collateral damage. They're using that to make a um, detection system. Now, you know, they're both the same idea that collateral cleaving either RNA or single stranded DNA. So I just wonder if. They heard each other at meetings. Oh, or, there's got to be all kinds of buzz. I'm buzz sure there's all kinds yeah. of skullduggery going on. Um, yeah. But the uh, <laughs> one interesting observation here is the based on the PDFs and looking at the page numbers, yeah. the Doudna paper that we're just talking about now um, appears first in science. Mm -hmm. And it may be that that one was uh, received first or... It was. Okay. It was received November 29th and published online February 15th. Okay. 
and the other one was yeah, a month was later and yeah and then they kind of means anything in terms of disputes but it is an right. observation right the other observation is i don't think we've mentioned it yet but this method in the uh, Chen and Doudna paper, they've given the name DNA endonuclease targeted CRISPR trans reporter detector. Right. Detector, yeah. And so if you're going to work in this field, you have to have somebody that can uh, make acronyms for you, or maybe there's an acronym generator. <laughs> I don't know. I would think Alan Dove would be good at that. Yeah, I would too. Perfect. <laughs> so there you have it three uses of CRISPR Cas to diagnose various things, including virus infections and SNPs. I think it's neat, and I must say that I'm blown away because I don't really follow CRISPR so much, and to read these was just so cool. It's a different way of thinking, and I love it. I really like it. This is really neat stuff. The, these are unfortunately not open access as far as I could tell. I, I mean, I signed in to get one of them, and it had to, and then I downloaded the others, so maybe one of them or more are, but they're not all open access. Unfortunate. Highly unfortunate. Shame on you, science. <laughs> you make so much money. Really, you. I guess they're afraid they would lose all their library subscriptions if they went open access, right? Yeah, it's complicated. And how much would they lose? Uh, a yotta billion dollars? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I pasted in the metric system prefixes table <laughs> because there was a little confusion between Zepto and Zeta. And except for the things that are close to one within uh, two or three orders of magnitude from one, everything that ends in an O is smaller, you know, 10 to wow. the minus something. And everything that ends in A is 10 to the plus 21. So yada, yada, Zeta, yada, exa, pita, and so forth. Those are 10 to the 18, 21, 24, et cetera. And then yocto, zepto, addo, femto, pico, nano. All and an O, and they're less than so, one. So Google earns Zeta dollars, and this can detect Zepto moles. <laughs> right <laughs> there, you go. I didn't uh, ever need to go beyond nanomole in my <laughs> in my career as a scientist. Right, Kathy, you uh, referred to a commentary. Yeah, here is there is one. It's in the same issue uh, by uh, uh, yeah Daniel Turto, page three eighty one. Of the same okay, issue, so I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't see that. Maybe that ought to go in the show notes as well. I like this supplementary figure fourteen that someone pasted in. Yeah, which is a I nice. Did. It's a nice summary of detector. Yes, and it's again. I I just think it's ridiculous to have thirty supplementary figures. Put them all in the bloody paper. Make the journal bigger. It's not like <laughs> right. And when you when uh, someone just commented that the the Doudna paper had. A fewer data, and I said, "Well, I'm not sure about." Yeah, you're right. Because I'm the, the to be rolling through the supplementary data. Yeah, you're data, absolutely so. yeah. right. What they put well, in the main paper is less, but they, the, yeah, you're they, right. No, they didn't. They didn't have as many figures, supplementary figures, as the Gutenberg paper, which had 36 and nine tables, 85 pages total of supplemental material. I mean, look, I know how to read a paper. It took me f almost all of yesterday to get through these. Now, granted, yeah. it was three papers, but it's just. Not easy to read if it's not in your field. Yeah. The way the papers are written is not at all clear. They don't explain really anything. And I had to go back to other papers to find figures to explain what they were doing. And I just don't think this is right. This is keeping it as inside baseball. Well, yeah. I, I picked up, you know, this morning I looked at the Google Docs and said, oh, I should read the papers for Quiv today. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, my God. This sorry. morning I tried to do that. Too, sorry, so. I'm very sorry, but yeah. I thought they would be good together. You know right? what? No, I we got we got together. through this. It's good. Yeah. There was another yeah. article in that same issue, by the way, on planarians, and I read that one. And that ah. had I don't know how many figures. How many, like, how many atomoles did they? Get <laughs> no, that they had. They were discussing stem cells and and how you can reprogram them in, in a directional fashion. And they had uh, like a three hundred pictures of one eyed and three eyed and four eyed. <laughs> You know, come on. But I do think now we're getting to a point where the journals are being a little unreasonable about keeping the length of the paper down, especially something like this is quite complicated, and there's a lot of backstory that you need to know. Lots. And, you know, sure, the people in the field will get it, but what about the rest <laughs> of us who want to right. read it and talk about it? I just right. don't think we're serving the the, the uh, needs of scientific journal communications adequately by doing this. And I don't know how we're going to change it. 
Well, look at it this way. At least they split up the two papers, the, the Gutenberg paper and the one from yeah, uh, yeah. Artist Sabetti's yeah. lab. By the way, <laughs> if they lose, will it be called the Gutenberg libel? Uh. <laughs> but to put this in perspective, they, this complaint about the paper can only be read by specialists is a very, very old complaint. It's gotten more severe in recent years. Yes, But course. the journal's solution to it previously, back in the print days, was, okay, we'll add perspective articles and pieces by, we'll hire some science journalists as well to cover these from a broader perspective. And people like me ended up working on stuff like that. Uh, but to pay for that, you have to charge subscriptions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so around and around it goes. And now uh, we're, we're all talking about open access and bemoaning the fact that these papers aren't open access. Um, and I've heard people in the open access world say, yeah, you know, we, we uh, really would like to support more science communication and, and front matter type of stuff, but they never do. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I think it's partly because they're not bringing in the kinds of money that an Elsevier would um, or, or a Macmillan. Mm-hmm. And it, you have to wonder, well, if we're complaining that the stuff is too specialized, are preprint servers going to fix that? And I think not. I think we could figure it out if, if the, papers were written to include the information that you need. I mean, I I, I think it's great to support these science writers like Alan Dove. That's fine. I have no problem with that, but I can figure it out if you write the paper properly. If the, if the whole paper was in one place, it would help everybody a lot, I think. And I, and I think that's a place where going online and things like preprint servers can make a difference. And if it was online, then you should just be able to click on something and get the background information. And, and also you wouldn't have this issue of space, right? Well, yeah, accessibility helps. So I found yesterday, I read a PDF, right? Yeah, and the right. references are not clickable. So I have to copy the, uh, then exactly. go over to PubMed, search it, find it, download it. Yeah. And yeah. okay, clumsy. it's clumsy. That's all. I have, sure, I have plenty of time. It's not a problem, <laughs> but <laughs> I can do it. I'm not complaining about that. It would just be nice if it were easier. And the journals are not helping us. No. They're not helping us. No. Well, I have to say that the, um, uh, to some extent, the solution to this is TWIV. Mm-hmm. All you got to do is listen to TWIV and you're okay. Bingo. Yeah, but we do virology. You know, people want to read about other things. Download the show notes too. I agree. You get the I know I see tweet, tweets all the time about people complaining about this or that. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, if you listen to TWIV, you would figure it out. <laughs> I saw, in fact, I wrote it somewhere. <laughs> I think there was an email. Somebody said, yeah, there's an email. It's coming up. Okay, if you listen to Twiv, you'd understand it. So let's read some email. Yata. Yata. It sounds like Yoda. Jacob writes, Dear Twiv Gang, I heard this on a 60-second science podcast this weekend and had to share as a listener pick because Vincent is always emphasizing the importance of high-quality audio for his podcasts. And he links to a short podcast called Bad Audio Can Hurt a Scientist's credibility research paper that was referenced can be found here oh, so there's a research paper hmm. good sound good research how audio quality influences perceptions of the research and researcher mm-hmm. so they um had they they presented identical conference talks and radio interviews from science friday in higher low audio quality and asked people to evaluate the researcher and the research they presented so yeah it's not surprising right I looked at the figures, but admittedly didn't read the paper in detail. This kind of study isn't the type that I would typically be reading and evaluating, but to my eye, the effect looks fairly small, especially in regards to whether the speaker was deemed intelligent or competent. (laughs) That said, with science communication, I think it makes sense to do all you can to reasonably, you can reasonably do to help get the message across. Jake is a postdoc at MIT. Well, I always said, yes, you got to have good sound when you do a podcast because that's all there is, the sound. And if there's nothing else, then I, I always turn off podcasts that don't have good sound. We ran into yeah. a problem on Twip the other day with that. Yeah. Too bad the electricity went off in Daniel's house and oh. had to use his cell phone. <laughs> he used his cell phone, but it was only for 20 minutes. Yeah, right? but it still was noticeably different. Noticeably I think that's the first time that uh, we've had a power failure. Maybe... I was thinking, Rich, didn't you have a power failure once interrupt uh, something? Oh, God. I went through all <laughs> kinds of problems at some point. You know, I mean, I had problems with my router. 
uh, for, right. for a while. And yeah, we had, I had a power failure. Yes. A couple of times where my, my, my router cut out. Bummer. Dixon, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Anthony writes, it's a good thing that TWIV is a podcast. Like Blake wanted to sit next to me. Oh, no. Little Blake wanted to sit next to me by my computer, so I put a chair with a pillow there for her. Francesco must have thought that she looked comfy and then took my chair. It's a good thing that with TWIV computer learning doesn't mean being right at the computer. So he's got a picture of himself sitting at the computer, and next to him is this adorable little cat. There's no him. There's two cats. <laughs> That's exactly. It's just two cats. Oh, he, they, oh, pushed, right. they took his chair. That's the point. Yeah, yeah Anthony typical is cat not stuff. You know, on the right. It's funny because I, do, I couldn't make out the object. Yeah, that's, the chair. I'm sorry. that's what's good about a podcast. You don't need to sit down, right? You don't. You don't. Mm-hmm. No, you don't. Hey, Rich, can you take the next one? Neva writes, Dear Twivisimos, this article was <laughs> fascinating to me. It highlights not only a little-known virus, but touches on many aspects of the difficulty of addressing these things. I thought this might be an interesting snippet for for you. you. Keep up the fabulous podcast, Neva of Buda. And she uh, links to an article from The Guardian called People Are Scared, the fight against a deadly virus that no one has heard of. And basically, this is an article that centers on a pocket of infection by HTLV-1 in Australia, where there are some communities there uh, with uh, uh, native uh, native uh, Australians where the infection rate is as high as 40 or 50 percent or something wow. like that. HTLV-1 is a uh, retrovirus that has, uh, you know, some sort of uh, similarities in a way to HIV. It's, uh, very, uh, transmitted the same way, um, by needles or, uh, sex or transfusion and, uh, has an extremely long latent period. This can have a latent period of up to like 30 years and ultimately results in a specialized kind of leukemia or, uh, neurological, uh, defects of one sort or another that mm. result in uh, not quite paralysis, but enough to put you in a, in a wheelchair. Uh, and w- one of the main thrusts in the article, uh, that they've got a little map that goes with it. That's fairly, uh, makes it fairly obvious why it is understudied is that, um, these infections uh, occur mostly in, um, developing countries, populations that don't get as much attention uh, globally or even locally in terms of healthcare. Uh, so it's a serious problem. And, and I think also the long latency um, uh, affects this as well. But we're getting into a period of time here where these populations, uh, their latent period is over and there's a lot of uh, disease popping up and nobody knows what to do about it. Uh, one of the things that interested me is I I wondered whether a lot of the anti-HIV therapies wouldn't be active on HTLV-1. And so I looked up uh, what I could, and it looks like a lot of the HIV drugs fail with H- HTLV-1. It's different enough mm-hmm. from HIV so that those uh, therapies uh, don't work. So it's a problem. You guys know who discovered HTLV-1? Be interesting. Gallo. Gallo. <laughs> Gallo. Joe Gallo. Robert Gallo, before HIV, in Robert. fact, and he thought HIV was another HTLV for a while. Okay, okay, mm-hmm. okay. I found an article where Gallo was interviewed about this Australian issue with hmm. HTLV-1. He says it's the most efficient cancer-causing virus that we know of. Neva, by the way, broke her ankle. Oh, I don't oh, no. That's too bad. Yeah. How did she do that? Surgery. Uh, Just fell? Uh, in a, uh, yeah. It, well, yeah. She was uh, in a gym class, okay, oh. and um, was uh, feeling too frisky maybe or something like that. At any rate, so a surgery in the whole nine. She, she really broke it. Okay. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I hope she's better for Twiv 500. Uh, she, uh, she says she'll be, uh, 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 I think, out of the woods by Memorial Day. So that gives her another month and she'll be around for, heck, you know, I'll schlepper to Twift 500, you know, 
<laughs> myself if she's still immobile. What a guy. Hey, <laughs> I'm retired. <laughs> That's right. Um, so someone found, probably Kathy, I would guess. No, I, I pulled this up. Alan. Twiv Alan 127, Dove. we talked about HDLV1. Very um, briefly. Yeah, it was, a, it was a paper in Nature Medicine talking about HDLV1 transmission and entry. I think um, we should... Do have someone who works on HTLV one do a episode with us? Don't you think? Yeah, that would, that would be, be good. I, I, it, it, I wonder how much, to what extent, the, all of the antiretroviral drugs have been tested with HTLV one because right. you know there are so many of them, and a lot of them are pretty, you know, vanilla type, you know, nucleoside analogs and that kind of stuff. I would figure that some of those mm -hmm. uh, uh, should have some activity. Anyway, yeah. one, one would I think didn't, I, I didn't know this uh, high prevalence in Australia, and then also they have this map where the high prevalence is. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it seems like there should be more research on this, and if we can find somebody that would be willing to come on, that would be great. Four, there are four types, right? One, two, three, four, I believe. Of HTLV one. Yeah. H hmm. No. H, they're not. I'm thinking of HTLV 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those are four different viruses. Is that right? HTLV 2. Let's see. Yeah, a virus closely related to HTLV 1. 70% right. genomic homology is predominantly in Native Americans and South American Indian groups. So they have very distinct geographic distributions. And then we have 3, where, where uh, it's even more different. Um, oh, HTLV 3 is a former name for HIV. That's what I was going right. to say. And oh, now I was it's, pretty sure HTML3 was, yeah. I think that may have been Bob Gallo's name for it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And I think, though, there is now a bona fide HTLV3, yes, in Central Africa. Oh, uh, so they didn't do like hepatitis and skip one. They did not. <laughs> and I think there's a controversial HTLV4. Yeah, there it is, HTLV4. And let me just try five. What, what the heck? <laughs> Nothing comes up for five. Oh, there is. HT, yeah, there's an HTLV5. And let's try six. <laughs> you know, with Google. Do I hear a seven? <laughs> there's, no, there's no six. So we stopped at six at five. Going once? All right. I mean, there might be a seven or an eight, you know. It's that we don't not know necessarily logical. Yeah. Well, I just was fooling around. Sometimes that works, you know. All right. We have one more. Kathy. Lucian writes Hi, Twisters. Thank you very much for the recent discussion on the decline in efficacy of the mumps vaccine. I took Michael Emmerman's virology course at the University of Washington last year, and for a final project, I put together a presentation on mumps, and I thought I might have some extra information to add. The CDC did look at the use of a third boost, and the results, though not terrible, were not particularly stellar. Antibody titers in individuals who received a third booster were highly correlated with baseline titer. That is, the effect was minimal. During outbreaks where a third MMR dose was tried, that's measles, mump, rubella, disease incidence did go down, but the third dose was not administered until after the peak of the outbreak, and it's unclear if the decline was affected by the booster or if it was the natural end of the outbreak. And then he gives a reference. Part of what makes designing or evaluating vaccine strategies for mumps difficult is that there are no correlates of protection. And while wild-type infection does seem to confer better immunity, titers from wild-type infection often aren't all that great either. Yoshida et al. report that wild-type reinfection can occur in individuals. They even found patients who had been vaccinated and still had multiple wild-type infections. And he gives the reference for Yoshida et al. One thought, which I think was mentioned in your discussion, is that it is possible that natural boosting occurred in vaccinated populations as a result of asymptomatic infections. And as vaccination has been successful, this boosting has gone away, allowing for new outbreaks. Thanks for all the work you do. Mm. Best, Lucian. And well, that's a problem if a boost doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but these were boosts. Is this a third boost right after the first two? Uh, I don't know. I think some of these are, uh, no, further down the road. Yeah, years <laughs> apart, maybe. Okay. Because that was the paper they suggested. Maybe that was what we had to do, another boost. But Right. Antibody, I think, the antibody titers were similar, but then 
But then in the actual epidemiological application, the third dose looked like it might have helped, but you can't tell if that was because the outbreak was already waning. Too bad, right? That's a problem. I don't know because yeah. yep. making a brand new vaccine, if you don't know what the correlates are, that's. <laughs> I I think I think as a first pass, the um, the recommendation to get a boost in when you're a little older is probably a good one. Sure. You know, the, we've got the vaccine. We know that it works mm-hmm. to a first mm-hmm. approximation. We know that it's safe, and so use it again. See if that deals with this, and if it doesn't, then we can go for the harder stuff. Okay, sounds good. Correlates of protection is a serious arc in this show. Yes. That, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> well, in, in arc. immunology in general. Yeah. Let's do some. You're right, you're right. You can't just go do make a subunit vaccine or something like that. No. Uh, anyway. Okay. Although I have to say for the shingles vaccine, right. For older people, they made one, which was basically the, the chicken pox vaccine at a higher dose. Not great. Wayne's, we did a paper on that. Now they made right. a subunit vaccine, a single viral glycoprotein with adjuvant. Beautiful protection. We don't know about durability, but beautiful protection. It's licensed. So sometimes it just right. works, right? Yep. If you don't try it, you won't find out. That's right. All right, let's do some picks. Alan, what do you have for us? Uh, I have an article about um, the news business, and this is a a really interesting aspect of it. Uh, it's an article on STAT, which if you're not already reading them, you probably ought to be. They do these neat um, dives into various subjects. And this is looking at the problem of towns across the country that have lost their local newspapers, mm. which has been well documented in newspapers, of course. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and an interesting consequence of that, an unfortunate consequence of that, is that this used to be a major source of information for epidemiologists. So the local news, if you're monitoring the local news and they're talking about how, um, you know, there are a lot of school absences or um, you know, there, there are these issues coming up because of uh, some kind of illness, that's probably not going to make the national media. It's not the kind of thing that's going to be picked up by the outlets that are that are now providing the main news in these areas. But it's exactly the type of thing that would have been reported in the hometown paper. Mm. And so epidemiologists for decades have been monitoring these things and using local news sources as ways of finding uh, of, as ways of detecting novel strains of flu or um, zoonotic outbreaks. And the CDC has been has been very straight, you know, very, very into that. Unfortunately, now these are going away. And the article talks to a bunch of folks in public health who are talking about how that's really causing them a problem. And they they Mm. now have no idea what's going on in a lot of parts of the country as a result. Scary. But even scarier is the fact that these local news outlets are being purchased by conservative news giants to feed nonsense in their lives. (laughs) But that's mm-hmm. something different. Well, or just news giants in general, because when you consolidate media like that, we know that that can that can lead to problems. Rich Pondit, what do you have? Uh, I just have a little video that I ran across. I don't know where. <laughs> that's a uh, it's a uh, what's the Science Friday video, uh, and it's a short video on how uh, recycling is single source recycling is sorted uh the automation and i just because cool. i've always wondered about this yeah right. it's you know, great I dump all this stuff <laughs> in my recycling and I, I imagine a whole bunch of people going through it no it's no. all a bunch of machines going through it okay good and uh, he describes <laughs> yeah. it in some detail it's pretty good so can they mix paper and plastic and they can sort it out sure yep I always wondered Paper, about plastic and metal you know, and stuff. I, I have I have all these bins with everything separate. I put them out front and they all dump it in the same truck. Yeah, so what exactly am I separating right. it for? That's right. Well, yeah, it's not it's liquids. All, here it's all single source. You you stuff it all in the same bin. It's not organic and, then, and it's not liquid, so therefore they can sort they can sort it out. Yeah. So they have machines that will sort through. They, they have machines that sort it all out and and based on different properties of this stuff. So for example, it goes through uh, something that. Uh, will basically shatter glass to start with, uh, and and um, but not 
decrease the size of other things. And then that goes through a sieve. So all the glass falls out. <laughs> right. All right. And then they've got, uh, st- it goes through fans that blows all the light stuff. That's somewhere right. That's and right. Things that discriminate between flat things and things that aren't flat goes through magnets and gets out all the yeah. metal yeah, yeah. and goes through, uh, some sort of the, the pretty refined, uh, plastic goes through, um, uh, infrared sensors that discriminates one kind of plastic from another and sorts and picks them out. This is unbelievable. It's amazing. Well, and once- and in the end, do they actually sell this stuff? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I hope so. They bundle it sure. up in bales and sell it to people. So rich part of my uh, teaching this semester at Fordham was to allow the students the freedom of inventing a city. Uh, we call it Fordhamopolis. And I, okay. I just got back from our lunch that we had to celebrate the end of the course. <laughs> and one of the students showed this video. Really? Oh, <laughs> They're right? put in their that's city. Cool. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Excellent. This is very clever how they designed this. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's great. It means it takes all the um, burden of having to sort from the citizens. Yeah, of course. And puts it in the hands of the automatic guy. Uh, I used to go Saturday mornings to a local recycling the boy scouts were always there right and you had to have everything sorted they had yeah, the white yeah. glass the that's brown right. glass that's the right. green glass that's, that's right. plastic and then there was an old guy there who would look no that doesn't go there that's right that's right <laughs> I, I remember two doing demerit that. badges <laughs> i remember doing that with my mom when i was a kid because she was a hippie and she was really early into this stuff and really we'd, we'd go to the recycling center and the best part was she would let the kids take the um uh the glass bottles and go throw them in the dumpster, which of course, smash. you know, you do with full arm yeah. and smash it all up the place. That was fun. Dixon, what but do you this have is obviously a whole lot more efficient. Exactly. What do you have for us, Dixon? Well, I have another um, visual. This is from a Cosmos magazine, and it's called When uh, Science Meets Art. But I would rather call it When Art Meets Science, because these uh, artists were inspired by um, science to... Um, the images of the science to the next level. And so there's a whole bunch of very interesting, um, some unrecognizable expressions of what the artist actually had in mind, but it's, it's just wonderful how science, once you've accepted it as a uh, way of thought, uh, can influence even the mind of a very creative person who has no intention of, of communicating science per se to the visual receiver and it, it's abstract art to them, and, and a lot of it is uh, very beautiful. So I just thought I'd put that in there. Didn't you? Have, nice. Didn't you have this last week, Dixon, or the <laughs> week before, or the week uh, before that? Uh, no, no, no. I had a, no. He had variations on this. Uh, uh, okay. You know me. <laughs> I'm consistent. <laughs> Kathy, what do you have? I picked something that I saw because it was tweeted by a professor here at the U of M, Meg Duffy, who is one of three people who blogs on a particular blog called uh, Dynamic Ecology. And she tweeted that she's uh, taking sabbatical and she's going to do some aspects of AI, and that's academic innovation uh, (laughs) for part of her sabbatical, and do things with respect to uh, mental health research. And so the title of the blog post Mm. kind of tells it all. Journalists have a responsibility to ensure ethical oversight of mental health research parentheses, and we do not currently have evidence that grad students are six times as likely as the general population Mm. to have depression and anxiety. And then she goes on to talk about how she saw this article in Nature Biotechnology about graduate student mental health, and she was struck by the fact that they didn't mention IRB approval. Mm. And then at the end of it, or they, they claim that the results show that graduate students are more than six times as likely to experience depression as compared to the general population. So she looked into it. Um, She wrote to the authors to find out if they had IRB approval at the same time, I think, as she was writing to Nature Biotechnology. And um, the author said, yes, they did, but Nature Biotechnology did not include that information. And Well, the, and I think she, she asked Nature Biotech, was there IRB approval and why didn't you mention it? And the editor... Right replied, well, this is this is an article in our careers and recruitment section. It's not a research article, so it didn't require that. Right. right. Which is a really <laughs> disturbing answer because it yeah. was it was citing primary it was citing its, it, you know, primary research on human subjects. Right. And uh, the reason that it doesn't 
show the six times figure that it claims to show is because the population was uh, a voluntary voluntary survey distributed by social media and email. So they didn't have a representative sample. Mm. And uh, to further the thing about um, the it not being a research article, according to the editor, um, I forget, uh, I'm not going to be able to find it here. Um, but she said the headline in the article was something about research shows that, you know, and yet this editor was claiming it wasn't a research article. So it wasn't uh, peer reviewed or didn't have the same level of. Uh, the title of the article is Evidence for a Mental Health Crisis in Graduate Education. And it was okay, actually, yeah. it was my pick two twivs ago. <laughs> Remember, ah, do you remember? Okay. Oh, we're, now I do remember. We were talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there you go. So I thought that was interesting. And I asked, I, I asked the general, you know, what, do you think it's always like this? And and you said, Kathy, twas always thus. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so that just yeah, you didn't believe it then, Kathy, as I, or yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, that it was any different from interesting yeah. though. Very interesting. We have no evidence. Well, it's good. I'm glad not to have evidence that graduate students are more depressed than the general population. Yeah. I have a, pay, a book for today's uh, CRISPR discussion. It's called A Crack in Creation. <laughs> it's by Jennifer Doudna and Sam Sternberg. And Sam is a uh, faculty member here now. He just arrived. And really? he was a PhD student with uh, Jennifer Doudna. And I know about this because he came by last spring and he told me about this book was coming out and he was going to come here as a faculty member so i've been reading it and it's a lovely history of CRISPR, right starting hmm. from the beginning and it's nicely written and they both wrote it although it's in her voice which is a little funny but she said that's for consistency but i would have other reasons why probably that's that way but anyway if you want to read about the history if you can get past the very beginning where she takes credit for this great revolution and you know she said up until now humans have evolved due to natural forces and now we're about to insert our hands into this so it's a, but the history is really good and I, I there are a lot of things i didn't know about it and uh, it's nice it's nicely written it's pretty clear it's good writing so if you want cool. to uh learn about crispr a crack in creation if you are an amazon prime member it's free for you no kidding. Well, right. Is there another book coming out from the Broad? Yes, <laughs> uh, I believe it already has. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a uh, I forget the title of it, but there's a, a CRISPR history that is basically all about yay yay Broad Institute. We did this all by ourselves. Ah, uh, uh, that people have. <laughs> thanks. See, that's right. So these no, are this, this right. one is very giving everyone credit. It's well, I don't, I don't know. I haven't read the other one, but people I've seen a lot of people complaining about <laughs> how it was <laughs> it, how it's angled in a particular way and and this one may be angled in a particular way but it it is important to recognize that there are there are multiple people who have there are more than 3 people which is significant because that's the maximum number you can have on a Nobel prize who have contributed <laughs> enormous amounts to the development of this technology and now they're jostling to see to to <laughs> get primacy in this ongoing dispute at which has a lot at stake I'm looking at Amazon. I don't. I don't find it, but I do see a T-shirt with on the front "Stronger, Faster, CRISPR." That's a cool T-shirt. I'd wear it. We have a listener pick from Tom in Austin, April thirteenth. New York Times article: "Trillions upon trillions of viruses fall from the sky each day," by Jim Robbins. After reading that article, I'd expect to find every virus in every animal, no matter when their ancestors emerged. <laughs> no, no, no. So I blogged about the original article, which is by from Curtis Suttle's lab. And it's a very interesting study where they basically put buckets up in the mountains in, the, in Spain, and they left them there for like two years, and they collected this, this stuff in it periodically. And then they purified the virus particles, and they counted them. And they show that, yes, indeed, viruses are falling from the skies. Um, yes. And where they come from is mostly the ocean surface, which is frothed up, and it gets blown up into the trophosphere. Like, it's carried mostly around. Mostly phage, right? Mostly phages. And um, occasionally when the winds change, they notice it came from the Sahara. <laughs> the dust in the Sahara came up. But they're, yeah, they're falling from the skies. 
We don't know if they're infectious because they didn't check that. They just did some uh, particle counts, basically. So they have a rate of falling. It's kind of interesting. Um, now, in this article, the, the article is a little wacky because it's all over the place. And in fact, Paul B. Nash on Twitter a few weeks ago was was bemoaning it. And at one point, he's, the author says, some authors, some scientists, they feel that there, there are cells up there, and that's where these viruses come from, which is ridiculous. I mean, there may be cells up there, but that's where, that, where these viruses come There are bacteria from. up there. There are. They're blowing around, yeah. And, this, and, and this, they have the phages. Way, they're not what? dropping their phages from the heavens. <laughs> they're coming from the seas. He showed that. He showed that they're coming from hey. seas in the Sahara. <laughs> what I found most annoying about this story is that it's there's, there's a history to this. People have been looking at... Um, at organisms precipitating from the sky for quite some time. <laughs> and we know already that dust and everything attached to dust from the Sahara blows yeah, across yeah. the Atlantic. Yes, of and course. settles down over, over the U.S. and over the Caribbean. Um, we know that this carries fungi, that it carries bacteria. This is another experiment showing that viruses are there because, of course, they would be. And there's yeah. absolutely nothing to get. <laughs> so, up so, in that. fact, most of the viruses were attached to dust. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of various sorts, yeah. Because the jet stream, the, the jet stream and the trade winds are carrying them across uh, well, across long distances. You know, they, they quantified it. So, if you yeah. watch the One Strange Rock um, that's been airing on the National Geographic Channel, yeah. the claim is that the Brazilian rainforest would not be as fertile as it is today if it were not for the winds that blow from the Sahara Desert with all the dust and dropped most of it in Brazil. Believe well, they, they mentioned that this could recede places that have yeah. crises, right? right? Yeah. yeah, that's perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, Tom seems to think that everyone's going to get infected with everyone, but we don't know what, they're mostly phages up there, right? So that, that's it. But this article then says maybe, maybe viruses came from outer space and then it gets a little bit yeah. wacky. Stop it. I don't think well, I'm carrying an umbrella. I don't care. What <laughs> that. The thing is, <laughs> that'll help. All right, there's plenty of good evidence that every that things arose here on Earth, you know, and more so than we'll ever have from anywhere else. Uh, and, right. and it's much less uh, unwieldy than an umbrella. You can just put on a, a simple hat and make sure the aluminum foil has the shiny side on the top. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, I just um, I just realized the thing that I was mentioning the other side of the CRISPR story. Um, was actually an article that I had read, which is in Cell and is surprisingly open access. Um, it's called The Heroes of CRISPR by Eric Lander. Mm, well, yeah, it's a perspective. It's a long perspective article that came out in Cell a little while ago that's um, very clearly angled at celebrating the Broad Institute's uh, role. Of, course, in this. of which Lander is a director. Which Lander is director of. And yeah. There you go. Nice, unbiased reporting. <laughs> I remember that article. All right, that is TWIV 492. You can send us your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. Consider supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Last time I said, hey, it would be great if everyone contributed a dollar. And so now I see people are editing their donations from <laughs> 10 and 5 to ah. That's not what I meant. No, it'd be better <laughs> if people who haven't contributed anything contributed something. Wow, I was so surprised to see that. Um, so anyway, <laughs> thank you for your support. Good job, Vincent. <laughs> yeah, really. Less crisp than you thought. <laughs> I blew it. I blew it. Dixon de Palmier is at trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. And your course is over. Yeah, today it was it was, it was a, 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 a celebration of the course, basically. All the students showed up. We had Chinese food. They presented their data, mm -hmm. and I accepted it, and um, they all went went home happy. My final is on Monday. Yes, I have to and make, then, I have to make it up what? tomorrow. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Dracaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for his music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. 
Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>